The beast is in my backyard. It has been for some time. Well, who do I think I'm fooling? It's never not been in that backyard of mine. Ever since I was little, and a good ways before then, the menace lies in a shroud of willows and blocks my view of the horizon. Every house down this road beyond its picket fence sits there, a beast identical to mine, though no one seems to care. I'll be honest, when I was young, I barely noticed its existence. And even when I did, I joined in with the neighbors to applaud its size, beauty, and persistence. But then when I grew old, I noticed the beast's willow trees would part, and out snapped its poisoned tongue onto the now burned skin of a select few passerbys it would mark. When I scrambled to get bandages, clean my wound, and plea for assistance, the neighbors' faces go blank like I had never existed. Then barren of protection, I set out to stop these aggressions at their root. I set foot on the backyard soil to end its violence with only my words, my incantations, and my loot. But the neighbors held back my arms, terrified I would ruin their fences and willows if I brought unto the beast even the slightest of harm. My shock transformed by this betrayal of my kin, for how could they not see the absolute contradiction in maintaining this peaceful village as it always had been by standing there, digging bloody nails into charred skin. It was then I took up a broken wand. Although hesitant at first, since I was no warrior, nor a hero, nor a person with exceptional amount of courage honored, I then set out resolute to vanquish a beast it seemed no one wanted conquered. Scouting my cobbled streets in search of companions to aid me in this pursuit, I debated if I needed others, or if it was best to go alone down this isolating route. With opposition and discouragement being the only voices I have heard, it's difficult to continue, and the thought of supportive company now just seems absurd. Then two whispers of support seep through the cracks in this stone road, but refuse to show face until the night leaves them completely shadowed. Enveloped in the dark, our hardy crew of three meet underneath the pines. To solidify each other's trust, we all reveal our scars the beast had left behind. The taller ones is across his back, and the shorter ones across their face. And in that moment, we make a pact and devise a plan to stop the beast from ever again wielding its violence over this place. It is the day to stop the poison. I am armed with only my wand, which is even still whittled down in half its original size. But it will be sufficient to enact our minor victory when combined with the tools of my allies. Between us and the beast, we share a knowing look to affirm our devotion. Then I raise my wand, cast my spell, and cut out its tongue in one swift motion. The tongue etched a circle of dead grass around where it fell. Startled, the beast awoke, recoiled back, and let out a fearsome yell. A yell in which each beast throughout the village awake as well, and then, in a ghastly symphony, that shriek they'd parallel. Though our triumph was small, we were ecstatic and simply joyous. But the next morning, our celebration was met with outcries and protest. Though their acid tongues scar their children and dictate the choices of their adults, the neighbors became accustomed to the beasts in all their faults. So we were punished. We were exiled and disgraced from the home we had just tried to help and make a better place. Despite the fortitude they had shown for so long, our youngest member cried as we turned our back to the home that said we do not belong. Is it wrong that sometimes I wish I had just kept quiet with my head down? The youngest of the three inquired. Of course not, I responded, for the path that is more difficult, even if it is right is more challenging to desire. But remember when you wish to just lower your head, that that same head carries the scars that remind us why we fight and the evil that we dread. Resilient and impassioned by the bitter knowledge of their quest, the three set up camp on pine needles and take a much needed rest. Wandering for some time, the band realized that they are not alone in their beliefs, and as they found others that agreed, their numbers did increase. After more time passed, the youngest overhears of an event occurring in their old home. This is a sign. We have enough support. We must go back. There's no more need to roam. I ponder the proposition as all eyes turned to me, and it was in this act of trust and hope I realized this was the next step in our journey. 
Standing once again on the threshold of the home I had been gone from for so long, I now knew what was needed to begin the process of righting many wrongs. Just leave the beasts as they are. You'll leave the village in disarray, the neighbors cried. I disagree, and I won't be shaken, I replied. But this time, the change will happen in daylight, with all those that support me by my side. Fully aware of the likely repercussions of this act, despite it being, in retrospection, small, I find the right words, look back at the crowd, and then step out from the mall. My supporters help clear the path as I approach the beast's spot of land and position myself on the ground to cast the spell just as planned. Though the beast remains asleep, several neighbors who have bypassed the crowd try to hinder my resolve by throwing punches and screaming loud. However, nothing they can do will waver my fixation, for I refuse to hit back, instead focus all my energy on this incantation. Then I speak several words, and in a blast of light, contact is made, and within seconds, the beast begins to fade. And by a minute's time, all that is left of the beast of any worth is a pile of dark purple soil seeping back into the earth. The shrieking from all the other beasts accumulates into a symphony in the background as the cheers of the crowd meld into one beautiful but jarring sound. The weight seems to be lifted, but as the celebration lingers over a bit of time, tension builds among the neighbors who find injustice in this crime. I knew the possible consequences. This heavy truce sets in my eyes. But this work is far from over, and I cannot be the only one on which everyone relies. So I pass on my wand and loot to the youngest, and with empty hands set out to another backyard determined to continue the plan we discussed. But as I round the corner of the house and disappear out of sight, I am met with a loud sound, my neighbor's hand, that for good puts out my light. The end is not indicative of the end of what we fought for. That wand will still be passed down now and forevermore. As the beasts, the willows, and all those in between continue to transform and dissipate, my memory lay on purple soil and pine needles to aid the next generation in the future they create.